I'm Matthew Howard. I'm the Director of Communications, Education, and Public Affairs here at the laboratory. We're really excited to have you here with us tonight for uh, the next iteration of Argon Out Loud. Um, the Out Loud Lecture Series, hopefully you've been to some of these. If not, um, if this is your first time, welcome. Um, the series highlights the cutting edge multidisciplinary work that the research that we do here at Argonne. Um, from using supercomputers to transform science and engineering to converting the sun's energy into electricity to revolutionizing the future of American transportation. These lectures have focused on the most important and fascinating science and technology issues facing our nation. Uh, tonight's lecture is no exception. We are here tonight to learn more about the challenges facing our nation's power grid, uh, the, the largest machine ever built. It's a nice way to think about it. Uh, our current electric grid was originally built in, wait for it, 1890, a long time ago. Uh, although, of course, it's been updated substantially over the years. Today, the, the US power grid consists of more than 18,000 electric generating units with more than 1 million megawatts of generating capacity, uh, connected to more than 450,000 miles of transmission lines. So it's a pretty impressive machine for that. Right now, much of that grid is unfortunately inefficient. In fact, if the electric grid were to be 5% more efficient, the reduction in greenhouse gases would be equivalent to taking, taking 53 million cars off the road. It's a striking number. Thankfully, Gunter is going to solve that problem for us tonight. <laughs> uh, um, but there are real tra technological challenges, as you might ima imagine, to uh, making the grid more efficient. And uh, uh, in fact, the challenge has been compared to repairing a car's engine while the car is hurtling down the road at a highway speed. Um, Argon scientists and engineers are working at coming up with creative and exciting new ideas to meet that challenge, and you're about to hear um, about them from our, my colleague, Gunter Konzelman. Gunter is the director of the Center for Energy, Environmental, and Economic Systems Analysis in the Decision and Information Sciences Division here at Argon. His research focuses on the development and application of modeling and simulation tools to study strategic energy and power sector issues. He's also leading Argonne's Wind Power Technologies and Analysis Program, and he's actively engaged in the lab's smart grid activities. He's renowned internationally as an expert in energy and power systems, written many journal articles, book chapters, papers, reports um, on these topics and others, and he's in high demand as a speaker for conferences here and, here and far and wide. Um, he's received numerous honors and awards for his exceptional research uh, and service, including a Fulbright scholarship. And I'm eagerly looking forward to hearing Gunter's insights and um, uh, on the future of the nation's power grid. So please join me in welcoming our featured speaker, Gunter Konzelman, as he presents, presents tonight's Argon Out Loud public lecture Renewing our grid power for the 21st century. Gunter. Thank you. Test, test. Thank you, Matt. Thanks for the uh, introduction. And thank you all for coming. This is really exciting to see so many faces out here in the audience, so many new faces, as well as uh, quite a few familiar faces, too. Um, and uh, I'd like to also thank, before I start, all the uh, folks that helped out setting up the posters and staffing the posters and engaging with all of you, answering questions. And also special thanks goes to Ann Schlenker. I don't know where is Ann, I can't see. Up oh, right there uh, from the Transportation Research Center and her group who uh, brought some of the electric vehicles and charging stations out front at, for you to, to look at. Um, and the final thanks goes to my family who's all assembled right here in the front rows. So uh, what I was going to do is uh, I'll start out with the key messages for you to take home as you leave here in about an hour. So I'll do this up front so you can then after this, you can just sit back, relax, and cruise along. <laughs> and uh, all I do is at the very end, I will we'll have a little quiz and see how much of those you'll still remember. Okay? 
I'll also stay down here on the, you know, on the ground floor rather than up on the stage. Uh, so the first one, the most important one, because my boss is here, <laughs> I have to say that it's a really cool place to work here. There's a lot of rocket scientists doing a really lot of cool stuff. Yeah. Um, second, when we talk about the grid, Matt's already alluded to that, it's, it's really probably the, one of the most complicated things we've ever built. And we really haven't built it over just a few years. We've really built it over a period of more than 100 years. And so it's something that has evolved piece by piece, bit by bit. It's grown almost like organically, but not really with a final design plan in mind. And so as we look forward in the future, we have to realize the things that we want our grid to do 20 years from now, it's really not designed to do all these things. And so we have to make changes. We have to prepare it for that. Um, now, traditionally, changes have come slowly. This is not an industry that's moving very fast. Um, however, the last 10 years or so have really seen a lot of things change um, at a very unprecedented uh, speed. And uh, a lot of these things uh, are really the, a, a result of s trends and expectations coming together in terms of what we wanted to do and new technologies emerging. And this really creates a lot of opportunities to really f transform the grid and, uh, and come up with a better system. And we'll talk about some of the shortcomings that we have right now. And these changes, really, these opportunities, they really are happening on both on the, the way we generate and we produce electricity, we call that the supply side, as well as on the demand side. This is all of us, uh, the way we consume electricity. And these are lots, there's lots of opportunities, but if we don't do it right, uh, things can go wrong. So there's also sometimes challenges that come with these opportunities, and we'll talk about some of those. And what it really means is that we have to change the way we plan and operate and run this grid, this big machine. And just in case you forgot, I'll say it one more time, <laughs> this is a really cool place to be. Okay, so what's the vision? Okay, there's a lot of words now coming up here. So these are the, two, the, the first two slides are the ones that have the most words. After this is all just graphics and charts, okay? Um, so this is, a, this, is a, this is a mouthful, okay? So, um, what we really want to say is that moving forward, we want to have a system that's first, we want it to be more efficient. And I'll show you some of the, the losses, the waste that we have in this grid. It's, it's really not operating efficiently. Um, we also want to make sure that it's on when we want it, right? I mean, we all depend on electricity day in and day out. You all have phones on you, you, can't, you, you have computers, TVs. You know, we, we use electricity every day, every moment of the day, and we take it for granted that we really only realize how much we depend on it when it's gone, okay? And so reliability is really important, and we want to make sure it continues to stay reliable, as reliable as it is right now, or even more so. Um, but what we do, we also want to make sure if we make changes that it's still affordable. It's affordable to all of us as consumers as well as affordable to our, our larger economy. Resilience is a term that's sort of come up lately. You know, you've all seen the news on Superstorm Sandy, uh, hurricanes in places, different places, storms, and the grid gets knocked out, uh, and a lot of people are out of power. And so we want to make sure that we can enforce, reinforce the grid and harden and strengthen the grid so that once a storm moves through an area that we don't really have to deal with millions of people out of power. Millions of people out of power for multiple days, which is a major, major inconvenience and a major cost. And the more flexible we make the system, the more likely it is that we can handle different stress factors that come our way, because things will always happen. But if we have a flexible, prepared system, we can deal with this, with those situations much better than without it. And security is another factor, right? So we're rolling out smart meters. I mean, smart meters are coming your way over the next several years here in Illinois. Each one will have an internet address, okay? And so we want to make sure that somebody can't just break the system, go in and do some damage. 
And lastly, we want to make sure we meet some of our environmental targets. We don't really want to do this and, and create a big me environmental mess, right? So we, that's another concern that we have, and we want to meet those requirements. So before I dive in, just a few basics, okay, on electricity. Now, you know, put this up, and you might say, okay, we're talking electricity. Why the heck is he showing me a picture of a gas pump? Well, it's to make a point. So most of you came here by car. Right? Drove here, you're using the car every day. Now, if you want to raise your hand, if you think you can tell me what the price of gasoline is right now. Who can tell me what the price of gas is right now? Raise your hands. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. Who, what's the, what, the, what is the price of gas? Who thinks they know approximately what the price of gas is? Okay, quite a few hands are up, right? Others are shy. Okay, so. What would you say? The total price is more like six or eight gallons, dollars a gallon. Total price. If you include the offset the environment. Oh my God, no, let's not talk about that. Just the price at the pump. What's the price at the pump? 350. 350 right on the money. 350 right now, right? 350. Right? So now, same thing with electricity. We use it day in and day out. Every time there's something plugged in at home, right? Now, who can tell me what they pay for electricity? One hand, two hands, three, four, five, six, seven. All right, so why is that? Right? Why is it? We all consume it the same way, right? That every day, every minute of the day, we, something is running and needs power. You know much better what the price of gas is. You can probably tell me what the price of milk is, right? But you cannot tell me what the price of electricity is. All right? This is what we're paying for electricity. Illinois happens to be right on the average of what the average price of electricity is, just about 12 cents a kilowatt hour. Now, that includes everything that's, in, that's on that bill. Right? I mean, the price, the, the electricity itself, the, the cost to, to, to transmit it, and st for the wires to send it to your house, and all the taxes and fees. All that rolled in is about 12 cents a kilowatt hour. And it changes, it, it varies quite a bit from depending on where you live. Hawaii is on the way left. It's really expensive. Guess why? Because it's an island. Everything has to be shipped there at a, at a, at a cost. And our low side is, uh, are some of the states in uh, Louisiana, North Dakota, Washington, Idaho. Washington, Idaho are the states where there's cheap hydropower. Uh, so, so it really varies a lot. Same with consumption, right? I mean, you probably remember how much you filled, uh, how much you, how many gallons you filled up in your tank last time you pulled up at the gas pump, but most of us really don't know how much they consume. All right, so the average for Illinois is about 800 kilowatt hours a month. That's below the national average, and it, again, it depends on where you live. And from Maine, 520 to down to Louisiana. Uh, almost three times as much. So it's really a lot of it depends on the weather, right? Where it's hot and miserable, you run your air conditioner all the time. When it's cold and miserable, you don't run your air conditioner all the time, right? But this is the typical pattern of consumption here, right here in Chicago, low at night and early morning. And as we all get up and get busy doing things and crank up our air conditioner, it sort of goes up and it peaks in the later afternoon around three kilowatts. And if we add this up over the month, it sort of ends up being about 800 kilowatt hours. Okay? So that's very typical. All right, so now this is the average household. This is a particular household. This, this happens to be my family. And I've, I've been anal enough to go through all my electric utility bills going all the way back to 1997 and putting those in the computer. Now, who is in their right mind willing to do that? Right? Not a lot. So now you look at this and you say, whoa, OK, what's going on? Right? So I mean, for quite a few years, we were right around the average. But then all of a sudden, in 2004, it started taking off. So what's up with the Konzelmans, you might say? Poor family planning. Uh, <laughs> everybody needing their own two TVs or you know, five computers. You know, there's lots of reasons. So if you want to find out what drives this, Come talk to the family members at the end of the talk. Okay? Not that I'm blaming them, but in fact, I'm much to blame for this too. But anyways, it changes every year. 
And it can be very different from the average, right? So the average numbers are just the average, right? Particular households could use more, could use less. Um, now the reason why we don't really know how much we're paying for and how much we consume is because when was the last time you looked at your utility bill? Huh? Can't even remember, right? Most of us don't even open it. They throw it, it goes in the recycling bin. You might get an e-bill, you never open it up. But even if you looked at it, <laughs> it's really hard to figure out what's going on on it because this is my bill and there's 14 different things on it. And I'm only buying one thing. I'm only buying electricity. Right? Why am I paying for 14 different things? I mean, you gotta be a rocket scientist or an Einstein <laughs> to figure that out, right? All right. So that's, uh, that's a, you know, so that's one reason, right? We struggle because we work with a product, we analyze and study a product with, where most people really can't relate to because you can't touch it, you can't feel it, you can't smell it, you cannot hear it, right? It's, it's all like just there, right? And that's the problem. All right, so that's the reason why I brought these, these numbers up, right? So we have, as Matt pointed out, we have o over 18,000 power generators spread around the country. We have 1,400 coal units. We have over 100 nuclear units. We have 6,000 natural gas plants, 4,200 hydro. It's very small, just a few lar really large ones up in the Northwest. And then we have several thousand solar and wind and biomass and others and oil, right? So I mean, a lot of power plants we need to supply the, the power that we consume every day. Right? It takes a lot. And some of these power plants are really large. This is, happens to be one that's just an hour's drive away from here. Braidwood, that's a nuclear power plant, can produce 2,354 megawatts. That's 2,354,000 kilowatts. That's a lot of kilowatts. And it can serve up to 2 million people. Just one power plant can make as much electricity that 2 million households consume. Now others are much smaller, okay? So it varies quite a bit. I just picked this one. Now when we look at how we make it, what we use to make it, what kind of fuel, then we see this picture, right? So this is something that's been building up, right? But I mean, we still use a lot of coal to make the electricity that we use, all right? 42 percent. A quarter of it is natural gas. That's changing pretty quickly. And then about a fifth nuclear, 8% hydro, not around here in Illinois, not much there, but out west. And then 3% wind, and the rest is just uh, others. Yeah? So that's the current picture. All right? Now looking forward, 20, 30 years out, most likely it's going to change. We actually want it to change. Right? We want to clean up our act. We want to do something different. Now this is the system that we're talking about. So this, this is all the transmission lines that are out there. Um, and uh, that's, the, that's the grid that we've built up over, over a hundred and some years. And it started out right around here on the East Coast and then started up building pockets in the Midwest. And then slowly it grew together into an interconnected, tightly coupled system. That means all of those 19,000 generators, when they, when they run, they run at the same speed. They're synchronized. They have to run all at the same speed. Okay? If they're out of sync, it's bad. The lights will flicker. All right? And if it's, it's really bad, then the lights will go out. Okay? We don't want that. So we use this grid to sort of make the power in all these different power plants, 19,000 of them, all over the country, typically further away from where we need it, right? Braidwood, remember, it's an hour away from here, out in the middle of nowhere. And then we use about 450,000 miles of transmission lines to ship it to where we want it, typically to a substation. We have about 60,000 substations around the country. And then from there, we, we bring it then to your house. Over 3 million miles of wires in the ground or on the poles. 3 million wires. 3 million miles of wires, right? So there's a lot of infrastructure out there. We sort of think there's about $3 trillion worth of assets around three trillion, all right? Some people say it's even four, right? So it's, it's not quite known. So a lot of money is invested in this, and this has been built up over many years. 
And so what it means that it's tightly coupled is it means if something happens in one corner of the country, down here, it'll affect a large part of the country. And so if this technology works, I will show you a little video. Whoops, not this. All right, so this simulates that this shows what the effect of a power plant going off in Florida, and you see how the system, how this effect sort of moves through the entire grid within a few seconds. So something happens in Florida, we can see it in Chicago a few seconds later. Right? So let's say if we think about the milk industry, right? If a cow falls dead in Iowa, <laughs> it really doesn't matter to you right here in Downers Grove, right? You won't be affected. But if a, if a power plant making electricity goes out in Florida, you'll see an immediate effect. Right? So, so that's what it means it's tightly interconnected, and that's a challenge. Because I have to be concerned not just what goes on in Chicago and in Illinois, I have to be concerned what goes on everywhere. Right? Now another problem we have is that we consume electricity at a very different, um, very different amounts throughout the day. Yeah? And so this shows the demand for electricity for all of Commonwealth Edison, for all of Common, okay, for 2012. And you can see if we sort this from the highest number to the lowest number, you'll see at the lowest point we use about 7,300, 7,400. And at the highest point, about 23,600. So that's a factor of more than three. All right, so there's a large variation in the demand over the year. If I look at gasoline, this is how gasoline demand varies from week to week over seven years. Over those seven years, there was a variation of a little, little bit more than 20%. Okay, so the gasoline demand doesn't fluctuate much, right? So if I have to meet this very fluctuating demand for electricity, I have to be ready for this. Now, how can I get ready for something like this? What do I usually use as, as, a, as a manufacturer if my demand for my product varies so much? What would you use to manage that demand? What do you think? Price. price? Okay, price. We can vary, use the price. What else? Warehouse, a warehouse. What else? What, what, how, what else can we still call a warehouse? Storage. That's right. Okay. So now, with electricity, we happen to have no storage. Now, if I look at the milk, you know, look around. In every supermarket, there's gallons and gallons of milk containers around, right? And so it doesn't really matter when you show up at the store. I'll always be ready for you, right? That's how I manage the, ch the, the changing demand. With electricity, I have a problem. With water, we have water towers. With oil, we have oil tanks. And for everything else, we have warehouses. Okay? In the industry, it's called inventory management. Right? But with electricity, we have very little inventory management capabilities because it's so hard to find a cheap way of storing electricity at a large scale. Now, all of you have phones. And all of them have batteries. We know how to store electricity, but that's a small scale. All right? But if I need to store a lot of energy, a lot of electricity at the grid scale, then that gets expensive. So another thing that so so another thing that we have a problem with is the efficiency. We have a lot of losses in the system. This is a complicated chart. I'm just going to zoom in on the top part. Okay, electricity generation. So we use our fuels and we make electricity. And if I do the numbers here, it shows me that two-thirds of all my energy gets wasted. Okay? Just one-third of all the energy that I put into all of my power plants come out as electricity. And that's a lot of waste. Okay? In that process, too, we, we generate over 2 billion tons of greenhouse gas emissions. Okay? So that's a concern as well. And a lot of other emissions, pollutants. Right? Another challenge is, OK, we like wind. We also like solar. It's clean, right? No pollution at all. But the wind doesn't always blow. And the sun doesn't always shine, right? 
And the wind is up and down all the time, right? Depending on what the weather does. It's a weather-driven resource. And so this shows us, for January last year, how much wind was, in, was, made, was, was produced in the Midwest. And as you can see, it's like an up and down, a roller coaster, right? So this is not necessarily bad, but as we put more and more wind power on our grid, we have to be able to get ready for this and manage this. Now, if I know it's happening, it's one thing. So that means I have to call up Tom Skilling and get a weather forecast. <laughs> And then I have to trust them, right? And say, all right, so how much am I going to trust them that the wind is going to start blowing and three hours later it's going to die down, right? So we need weather forecasting. And there's a lot of work that happens here at the lab and elsewhere that we do. Better forecasting gets us, helps us get ready for this. But that's just one piece of the puzzle. There's other things that we need to do for this. Another problem with wind is usually there's a lot of wind in spring and, and winter and not as much in summer. And as you could see from before, summer is really when we need to consume a lot of it, right? Because that's when we run our air conditioners. So that's not really well in line with how we need it, right? With the sun, similar, right? On a clear, clear, uh, clear day, blue sky, it's red. I can, I, it's easy to forecast this. If clouds move through, you'll look at the green, you're looking at the green and the blue line. And then it gets tricky. Okay, so same problem. So again, forecasting is important. And then being able to manage that. Because you, you still have the up and down, which you have to deal with. But as long as you know the up and down is coming, it's not so bad. And these are the guys who are doing that. All right? So you know, when we're talking about a smart grid, that sort of implies that we have a dumb grid right now. <laughs> right? This does not look dumb to me. I don't know about you, but looks like a lot of technology is in this thing, right? Now, where the dumbness happens is just right before your house, okay, in the last mile on the distribution side, that's when we're not as smart, okay? But on the big picture, on the big grid, there's a lot of stuff that we, we know and we can do, right? And so these are the guys, essentially think of like an airport, right, the control tower. These are the guys who sort of say, all right, flight 101 is taken off now, and then three hours later, it's going to land somewhere in, I don't know, Denver, OK? So they're scheduling the, the guys in the control towers, they schedule the flights. They work with the schedules, and they make sure the flights are all taking off on time and landing on time. And that's on the perfect day, right? And this, we do the same thing here, too. We have a schedule for the next day, and we try to run the system based on that schedule. Same concept, OK? And of course, just like with flying, sometimes stuff happens. Usually weather happens, right? We had a lot of people who got stranded today you know, just because of weather, because of the storms. And so when sometimes some, something happens, then all hell breaks loose. And then we have like blackouts that could sometimes affect 50 million plus people, right? Like it happened 10 years ago. And one power plant went out overloaded one of the transmission lines. That transmission line gets hot when it gets overloaded, and then it means it sort of sags down, touches a tree, goes out too, and from there it just is one thing after the next, and we were not ready. We didn't see a lot of that happening. And before you know it, 55 million people are out of power. Seven to $10 billion in losses. That's a lot of money, right? We have these happening all over. You know, if you get stuck in the elevator when the power goes out, I'm sure you're going to call up your utility company and say, what the heck is going on? Right? It's, it can be dangerous. We have, you know, every time power goes out, we have to throw away food. In our, from our own refrigerator, two years we were out in Downers Grove. I was out for three days. Right? Had to clean out the refrigerator. Right? Supermarkets have to do the same thing. And of course, everybody probably remembers that one, right? All right? And the biggest one was in India, OK? It, happened, and not, it doesn't just happen here. It happens everywhere, right? 700 million people without power. Yeah, it's huge. So, so, so when, the grid, when something happens, it can get really bad. And we want to make sure this does not happen as much anymore. And we, tried, we will try to contain it. So we have to work towards that. Now, especially the problem is if we have a major weather event coming in, like Sandy, right? 
Sandy knocked out the power on the East Coast, 14 to $26 billion in damage just for that storm alone, just from the outages of the power. It's a lot, it's a big number, right? It's a, it's, there's also quite an uncertainty because we, it's hard to estimate this. That's why it's, it's a pretty widespread, but still, these are large numbers. This is two years ago. We had a tornado moving through, and guess what you see? You see that the, the tower, the, the line's down, right? Trees get knocked over, take down the line, power is out. Right? And we have to wait for the comet to come by to clean up the mess, and then only then can the power come back. If we had a smarter grid and we could reroute the power, we could pr provide power to you much more quickly. Right now, it could take days and days. And so since we have these severe weather events, more frequently as it seems, you know, we, have to get, we have to look at the fact that the, uh, these damages keep going up and up. They vary a lot. As you can see, 2008, Hurricane Ike actually caused a lot of those damages. But on average, 18 to $33 billion every year we lose due to big storms knocking out power. Yeah. Now sometimes big things can make can cause a problem. Other times, it's the little ones that give us a hard time. Okay, did you know that squirrels, they teeth all the time. Their, 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 their front tooth is growing 10 inches per year. So if they don't chew, they're in trouble. So they constantly join. All right, and they like to chew on power lines and, and transformers and whatnot. There's hundreds of short-term outages for maybe a half hour, an hour around the country every year, affecting tens of thousands of people. Now you could say, all right, we're inconvenienced. The outcome for the squirrel <laughs> is a little worse, okay? So I think I'd rather be sitting in my dark home than be the squirrel, okay? So, so this is where we're at right now, and so there's all these changes that are coming our way. And, the, and again, as I said, they're happening both on the supply side, on the technologies that we're using to make the electricity, as well as on the demand side. Smart grid, we'll talk about this a little bit. Electric vehicles, you've seen some outside, and there's also posters out there. A lot of things come together. It almost is like a perfect storm, because we're pushing and pulling in different directions from all kinds of directions, actually. And so, when I say, when I look out in the future now, you have to realize that I don't have the crystal ball. So I don't know how these things will play out. No one really knows how these things will play out because nobody really can tell you the future. The only one who can tell you the future is this guy. <laughs> if you feed him a quarter, okay? All right, so you gotta realize, I look at historical trends, and if I do make a statement about the future, I'm, I'm as smart as, as just like as you are, okay? It's not much difference, I can't project the, the future. What we have seen, though, is a dramatic, and this is really dramatic change, and in the relationship between how much coal and how much gas we use to make electricity. Okay, so you see, for quite a few years, it's been pretty steady. But then really in the last four or five years or so, there's been a really fast, significant change. And this is, of course, based because we found all this new natural gas called shale gas. You might have heard of that. And because we have now so, many, so much more natural gas, that has driven down the price for natural gas. And so natural gas, using natural gas to make power is now much more competitive and actually competes directly with coal. And so, in 2012, we were almost equal. That's amazing. And it, it, you, I told you, you know, this industry is not moving very rapidly. This is, a, this is an amazing change. Okay? Now, it also helped us, if, we look, if you look at your natural gas bill, at your NICOR bill, you should have, and you look back four or five years, maybe you still have them, I have them on my computer, <laughs> you can look back and say, hey, oh my God, you know, I'm paying half as much as I used to pay. It's just because of that. Also, of course, since we're using a cheaper fuel to make electricity, it's also reduced our electricity bill. Most of you probably come from communities that sign an aggregation plan. You may or may not be familiar with that. But 
on average, over the last year or so, most of our, all of our electricity bills have dropped by over a quarter, 25%, largely driven by the things that are happening in the natural gas side of things. Now, in addition, we're introducing a lot of clean energy, solar and wind. And this is solar, OK? And so if you, if you think solar is a very small kind of thingy, it's not anymore. We actually have two very large installations here in Illinois, a 10 megawatt facility actually in Chicago, and a 20 megawatt facility just downstate. Okay? And these are large. I mean, you can see, you know, this, this covers an entire field here, right? And uh, so it's not small, small installations anymore. We're talking large scale installations. And it's growing very rapidly, right? It's growing exponentially. It's a very rapid growth rate. We're now at 8,500 megawatts, or 8.5 gigawatts. Germany is the world leader with thir close to 33 gigawatts. Out of a worldwide, we have 100 gigawatts of solar PV. Just for comparison, in the US, we have about 1,000 gigawatts. All those 19,000 power plants, they add up to 1,000. So use that as a reference, OK? So we have worldwide solar, we have 100. And here in the country, we have about nine. And it's growing very rapidly. So if you, if you project this out, then you'd say, all right, well, right now, solar is, very, is small. But five or 10 years from now, it might be a major player. All right? Same with wind. Wind has grown a lot. And these are not small wind turbines anymore. And I'll show you a few examples at the end. These are big, big, big turbines, OK? And so now we are at 60,000 megawatts, or 60 gigawatts. Worldwide, we have almost 300 gigawatts. So that's, a lot, that's, a, that's a lot of wind, OK? And if we look at it state by state, we see that actually Illinois is, doing, is a very active state. Midwest, there's a lot of wind. There's a lot of wind farms. You just have to drive out west for an hour or so, less than an hour, and you'll see big wind farms. Hundreds of wind turbines, pretty large wind turbines. And what really happened last year was the amazing thing was that for the first time ever, we build more wind than anything else. We didn't build more nuclear. We didn't build more coal or gas. We actually built the most things we built was wind. That was number one for the first time ever. So that just shows you how dramatic of a change is going on in this industry. Uh, now, we have a sort of a target of, of coming up with 20% of our electricity from wind. And so we sort of postulated this path. That's the blue line. So if we follow that path, we can sort of come about 15 years from now, we would reach about the, a, a share of wind of 20%. So 20% of everything that comes out of your sockets will be coming from wind. That's, pretty, that's a pretty aggressive goal. Yeah? And so far, the red line or the brown line is what we're actually having. So we're really doing fairly well. So far, we've done pretty well in sort of actually exceeding the plan. Now, the, the, green, the green dots are sort of showing us what people are saying over the next one or two years, how much might come on. And there's, you can see there's a lot of uncertainty around it, because there's some dots, green dots, that are low and some are high. So again, since no one has the crystal ball, we don't really know. So the near-term outlook might be a little vague, not, not as strong uh, as we would like. But we're, so far, we're doing very well in following the plan. The other thing that's happening is smart meters, right? So almost 40% of our households now have a smart meter. That's about 46 million meters out there right now. All right? I have one at my house. And I'll tell you a little bit about how we use that meter in a, in a few minutes. So what's Argon doing? Given all these trends, given that we see this major shift from coal to gas, given that we see all this new resource coming on, solar and wind, and that's, that's a constant up and down, you know, variable resource, heavily dependent on what the weather's doing. And, and given the technology challenges, what are we actually working on? And there's a lot of work that goes on. Uh -huh. And so I, I don't have the time to capture all of it, so I'm going to just touch on a few of them. Obviously, the first one is we talked about storage, right? So Argon's charged with improving the performance of batteries and other storage technologies. All right? So for the next five years, we'll be working on that. 
see if we can come up with a warehouse for electricity. Can we do that at a reasonable cost? There's two things that we need to, re we need to work on the batteries for the vehicles. You've seen one or two outside. But we we'll also need to work on storage for the grid. Okay, again, for the grid, we're talking warehouse size storage. Uh -huh. um, now, another one that we're also working on, and that's the, that's the one that we're using right now at a large scale. This essentially is a big battery. This is the Glen Canyon Dam along the Colorado River. And the water behind that dam is essentially your energy. I control when I release that water through the turbine and make the electricity. Now, the charging is a little bit iffy because the charging, I'm at the mercy of Mother Nature, right? Because it depends on how the, when it rains and how much rain will end up in that, in that reservoir. But the discharging, I can control, right? So it's sort of like a semi-battery, okay? Now, the other thing that's a real battery is if I take two buckets of water, okay? A bucket of water at the bottom and a bucket of water on the top of the hill, and I can move that pump, that water up the hill, and that's how I charge my battery. And I usually do that at night. And then I let the water run down through a turbine to generate power, meaning I discharge the battery during the day when I need the power. And we have these all over. All right? And we actually have one on, on, the lake, on Lake Michigan. There's about a 360 foot difference in elevation in Michigan. And it's called Ludington, and it's a fairly large facility. And so that's a real battery because I control when I pump, when I charge, and I control when I discharge, when I let the water run down the hill. We've also worked, and there's a poster back there, we've also wor uh, worked over the last three years to develop a tool that we can use to do a large-scale regional grid planning all right, to identify where is all of our clean resources, where are they? All right? Right, and where are the concentrated pockets of those resources? And if I can identify concentrated pockets of resources, then I can say, well, maybe we should build some kind of transmission to these red areas. Have to make sure that if, in fact, there's a lot of clean resources in those, in those areas, let's make sure we can ship them from there to where we need them. Right? Make sure the highways are there, the transmission lines are there. And so this is a tool that's available online, and people log in, and they use that now for their regional, for their, for their, for their planning purposes. Uh, this is a really exciting project. I hate to say, I mean, I think Edwin sent me an email. He was not, he's not here today. I told him his picture was going to be in the talk. Um, this actually, you probably have heard of the, of the IBM Watson, right? The computer that plays the game and competes with you and me and always beats you, you know. I said, it's really a super smart learning machine. Well, we teamed up with IBM to use that very technology to make solar forecasting better, okay, so that we can come up with a better forecast for tomorrow. Okay, so why not use that brain power, this ultra smart computer, to make sure that we, when we forecast solar power for the next day, that we're doing a better job than we're doing right now. And we use a lot of partners in this project. And this is why we need to do this. So as I said, Germany is the world leader in solar PV. They have, they're the size of Montana. Imagine 80 million people living in the state of Montana with the solar quality of the state of Alaska. And they have five times more solar PV than we do. Okay? And so in this very small place, and so sometimes when the weather changes, when the big weather fronts move through, it affects the whole country okay, very quickly. And so they had one case, uh, this, was, uh, this was in 2011, where within six hours, they lost 30% of their entire solar PV power within six hours, it went down. Okay, so that's a big, big, big loss in solar power, of power that's generated and injected into the grid. And so if I can't forecast that, I have, I have a problem. Because then, remember the guys in the control tower? If they don't know that this is coming, we have a problem. It's the equivalent of you being in the plane, and the guys in the control tower don't know that you're running out of fuel up there in the plane. You're circling and circling, right? Okay? Because then we'll have a problem. We might have a crash. So we need to do that. 
And we also work on things like, all right, so now, assuming I know that this front is coming through and affecting our how much solar power we generate, I still need to be able to balance this, right? Because what happens when this goes down? Somebody else has to go up, right? So if the sun goes down, somebody else has to go up. If the, if the solar power goes up, somebody else has to go down. Same with wind. So there's this balancing act, this juggling act that you have to do. Remember, that's the guys in the control towers in those control centers. And so even if they know that this is coming, they still have to be able to do that. Uh -huh. And so what we, what we do is we develop models that help them better prepare for this, okay, to run the system more efficiently, to save money. And when we run that, when we show that, we show that by using better tools, you can actually save money. You can build fewer power plants. If I combine those tools with a smart grid, I can, build, uh, I can save money both on the investment side, and since I run my system more, uh, more efficiently, I can also save money on, on a day-to-day -day operational basis. Better tools lead to cost savings. All right, so a smart grid. I don't know, does anybody have a smart meter yet at their house? People in Naperville, I suppose? Anyone else? A few? Okay, we've had a smart meter at our house since 2008. So this is our, uh, I don't have a picture of the meter, but, but here's all the things that I'm using to sort of take full advantage of the meter. I have a controllable, programmable thermostat, and I actually read the manual. Yeah? <laughs> a lot of people have those, they never read the manual, they don't even know how to program it, right? Um, I have all kinds of little gadgets that allow me to play around the house with figuring out who consumes power, and controlling power. I plug in my, my dryer or my washer into one of these things and actually it receives a signal from the grid and says, hey, don't run it right now, run it two hours from now. All right, so what does that help me do? This is the power of, this is the price of electricity that I pay. You pay a flat price. I actually pay a price that changes every hour, okay? And if you look at this, and I put this red bar down, what do you notice when you look at this? What's the amazing thing about this? They're down. They're negative. So when did you go to Chua last time and they actually paid you when you checked out? <laughs> did you get a rebate on your credit card? No, you don't remember that, right? You ever remember buying anything where they actually paid you when you walked out the store? Not really, right? With electricity, funny things are happening. Okay? And the reason for this is because, lots of reasons, but simply put, it's, there's not enough flexibility in the system, and so sometimes it's cheaper for them to pay you to take it than them to turn things off. All right? So we have an oversupply. We have too much electricity on the grid for too little demand. And that's when prices go negative. And so if I am a smart meter household, I can take advantage of that because guess what? The best time to use things is when the price is negative, right? Because that's when they pay me, right? Okay, so back in 2008, we started this experiment. So this is what we consume in our household. The blue line is what we consume. Hour by hour, and you see it goes up, and now this is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So it's a whole week. Okay? And the red bars are the prices. So the price changes every hour for this meter. Okay? And my consumption changes every hour. And it, does, it does that for you too, right? Except that you're paying the same price no matter what, no matter when. I pay the red price that changes every hour. Now if you look at this, you say, all right, well that's not perfect, right? Because the price is high and my, my numbers are high. The blue line is high when the red bar is high. When the bars are really low, my blue line is still high. That's really not a good match. So I fiddled around for like a month or so, and mostly really with my thermostat setting, okay, my programmable thermostat, reading the manual, figuring out how it works. Uh, now we're looking like this. Now look at this. My consumption, my demand is way up right there when they pay me. <laughs> this was a good hour, a very good hour. Uh, 
prices are high, demand is the lowest. Prices are highest, demand is the lowest, right? So, so I shifted how I consume to take advantage of those prices. You could do the same thing once you have your meter at your house, if you want to. It's not mandatory, it's your choice if you want to do that. If you want to pay this red price or if you want to pay a price that stays the same throughout the entire year. Totally your choice, okay? So don't be afraid. But it's, it, this is optional. But what this allowed me to do is, look at this. So every month I get a summary, and over this period of time, we save close to $3,000. So that's nothing to sneeze at, right? I mean, it's $3,000, it's $3,000. However, it took me 60 months to get there, right? So that's about $40 to $45 a month. So that's not as exciting. So if I try to get people excited, then I'll tell them, hey, I saved $3,000 with my smart meter. Wow, this is cool. If I tell them, oh, you can probably, it's, if it, it go, gets back to $20, $30, $40 a month, they say, oh, okay, all right. I have lots of stuff that comes in the mail that promises $40 a month savings, and I throw them away, right? It's hard to get people excited about 20, saving $20, $30, $40 a month sometimes, okay? So it's, that's a challenge. But savings are possible, and if you stick with it. Now, the problem is these savings, they come at a certain sacrifice. <laughs> Because what, what it really means is that my air conditioner runs all night. And you can talk to the family up front here. They're ready to kick me out of the house soon after five years of doing this. But you w wake up and it's freezing cold. Uh -huh. Then, of course, it turns off. The air conditioner stops running at 8 o'clock and it doesn't start running until 6 p.m. in the afternoon. And so, of course, by 4 or 5, it's miserably hot in the house, right? And this is what my dog thinks. <laughs> and again, you can ask them what they think. I can't put that in print, what they think. Okay, but you can ask them later on. So this is a smart grid. So it's an exciting opportunity as long as you're willing to make some sacrifices. It's not going to come easy. But let's say if nobody's home during the day, what do you care if it's hot in the house? If you're working home all day long, it might not be for you. You might be better off sticking with a regular pricing plan. All right, last two topics, wind, okay? So this is what the people used to think of what wind turbines look like. This is what wind turbines look like now. Look at the guy sitting up here about 200 feet up on a tower. Down here is the rotor, right? They're big, okay? This is the, the latest size turbine, right? These things are monsters, okay? And we want to go even bigger. We want to go twice as big as this. This is 6 megawatt. We're getting ready for 10, 12, 15 megawatts. And the problem with those is then the thing on the top gets too heavy. And so we have to reduce the weight. And so one thing that we do really well here is to make small generators because we can use our exper ex expertise in our physics division using superconductivity. And if you use superconductivity for a motor, you can shrink the size of the motor and the weight. And all of a sudden, you can build a wind turbine that could possibly produce 15 megawatts. Really, really, really huge. Uh -huh. And why, we, why do we do this? We do this because we want to get ready. Because right now, all of our turbines are on land. But the really, really good resource for wind is offshore, away from the land. And there's about it's four times as much as what we need. I told you earlier, we have 1,000 gigawatts right now installed. Total, all of our 19,000 power plants account for 1,000. There's 4,000 alone in those, along those coasts. There's 740 just in the Great Lakes. Now, of course, it means you'll have a lot of turbines out in the sea. Some people don't like that. Right? So there's issues with this. It's not that easy, right? But the resources there. We're not saying you can tap into this easily, but we're saying there's a big resource out there. Let's explore it. Now, we just put the first test turbine in the water, just one, we, all the, you know, along here, just one turbine in the water so far. But it's a great potential. The other thing that we're working on is electric vehicles, right? So here's when the president was, came to visit Ann's group, toured the facilities. We want to know if these vehicles take off, if they can reduce the price of the battery and bring down the cost of the vehicle, Will these things take off? 
These are hybrid electric vehicle sales. These are electric vehicle sales. So if all of a sudden we'll have millions and millions of electric vehicles on the road, how does that affect the grid, right? Can the grid actually handle that? And a lot of it depends on when you actually plug in. When do you charge? Will you charge at nighttime? It's not a problem. If you plug in at 3 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon, we may have a problem. Depends on where you are. Uh -huh. So these are things that we're looking at just to make sure that as we really move towards an electrified transportation sector, you know, that the grid is really ready and prepared for this. And another one that we're trying to do, and that's, this is really where a lot, one of the key strengths comes in, and for those of you have, who have been here for, to a previous Out Loud talk, is the computing side. Because we have big computers, yeah, and we can bring those to bear to solve these problems, to help us get a better understanding of how these things all play together. For one thing, if we have smart meters at every one of our house, we have a, just a tsunami of data coming our way. Okay? It's like there's a, there's a ton of data that comes our way that we don't really know yet what to do. Okay? Just smart meters alone will increase the amount of data by several thousand times. All right? If we implement a full smart grid, we may produce several times all over the information that's in all of our libraries, all of the libraries across the entire country, two petabytes. We will generate that much and maybe more every year just for the grid thing. Imagine that, right? So we have to be ready for this. And so we work with our math and computing sciences guys and the computational people to figure out how we can use some of the data that's going to be collected very soon to improve the way we run the grid. All right. Who can remember the key point, the first one at the top of the list? Very good. And the rest you can probably remember too. So with this, I'm more than happy now to answer any questions. Yes. Hold on, the microphone is coming. There is a shopping center in Berwyn that had uh, windmill, uh, wind turbine generators, but they were maybe eight feet tall and they were round that span, they, they spinned on their axis. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Um, what, what's the difference in those kind of uh, wind generating devices versus the wheels that go around the, the fans? Okay, so, so it's actually spinning this way, right? It's, it, yeah, it's spinning. Right. Yeah, so the, the axis like is this. actually a vertical axis yeah. rather than a horizontal axis. Okay, exactly. so, so it, it, is a, it is a technology that we had tried in the past, but for the large turbines, we sort of abandoned this. But it's coming back again because I told you, right? I mean, so if we make bigger turbines, bigger and bigger turbines, so at one point, it gets really top heavy, right? Because the generator, the motor, the gearbox, all of that it gets really big and really heavy, and we can't build the towers and the foundation strong enough to make sure that this thing stays safe, right? Even when you have a typhoon mo moving in or a hurricane or a tornado, right? We want to make sure that, thing, that this thing does not get knocked over. So with a, with a turbine that sort of uh, rotates like this, all the heavy stuff is at the bottom, all right? So, so theoretically, if we knew how to scale this up, we could actually make really, really big Turbines, okay. So, so there's the work that goes on, not here, not here at Argon, but at other places. They're actually starting to explore this again, just for that very reason, because you can, you have, will have all the heavy equipment at the bottom, so you don't have to worry about the, the structural problem of having like hundreds of tons of equipment 300 feet up in the air, right? So, so it's a promising technology. It's, it, it's doable on a small scale. And so, but it's, but it's not very common. So it's, an, it's a rather unusual turbine, I would say, that they pick, but um, they're they are, they are out there. Um, but on the large scale and the utility scale, it's not used at all right now. It's, it's very much dominated by the three blade ro rotor. Hold on. 
Yeah, uh, in the present uh, grid, you say there's about two thirds lost in energy. Yeah. Is is there a way? Uh, are you looking at like cryogenics or DC transmission lines, or to get this efficiency up? It seems like a lot of loss. Yeah. So so most of the losses, I mean, so the two thirds of the losses that I mentioned actually happen in the power plant themselves. So when you say cryogenics, superconducting wires, you know, eight high voltage DC lines and superconducting wires, there is actually research that goes on in that. But that's additional losses even. So what I'm talking about was just the losses in the power plants themselves, two thirds. So then we're sending one third to you, towards you. And in that process, from the power plant through the transmission lines and the distribution lines to your house, we're losing another 7%, 5 to 7%. So the cryogenics, the superconducting wires, and the DC lines, the direct current lines, they would only reduce, they, they would lower the losses in the wires to 7%. They don't address the two-thirds losses in the, trans, in the, in the power plants themselves. So it's, it's being looked at, it's potential, but not so much to reduce losses, but more like to be able to ship more power over the same space, okay? So like if you look at, you know, you look at transmission lines, they need a lot of space, right? It's called the right-of-way, right? It's very wide. AC, the standard transmission line needs a big transmission right-of-way. With DC lines, direct current lines, you can reduce that right-of-way substantially. Or you can build two or three of those in the same spaces where you could just build one AC alternating current line. Yes, there was one right here. Yeah, I concur that it's a cool place to work. When I was in it graduate is a cool school, place to work. I worked here when I was in graduate school. You're sitting right yes. next to the right per perfect oh, person. Oh, really? Great. Yeah, yeah, well. <laughs> well, you, you did mention DC. And, yeah. and one of my big proponent ideas is high voltage DC. Yeah. It eliminates all the, the matching frequency problems and all that stuff that yeah. can go wrong. And you can build them underground and, so and, that right. there's no yes. weather related yes. issues. Yeah. So you, hint, you hinted a little bit about that earlier. Mm -hmm. But what about capacity? If we made these very large, cheap, heavy batteries, they don't have to be very efficient, they just have to have a lot of current, yeah. to eliminate all these instantaneous demand problems and just spread them all out. Just spin them all up? Spread, spread them out. Spread them out. Oh, Put them yeah. every sure. substation. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I mean, so that's clearly an option to, to, to manage that, to manage that variability is, is that. So I, I, I agree with you. But, but you have to look at the cost, right? I mean, so the cost of the technology is higher than the traditional technology is right now, especially if you're talking lines on the ground, DC versus AC, storage. I mean, the cost is just not there yet where it can compete. I mean, this is the reason why we got this, this research award to reduce the costs of, of those technologies of storage. Yeah, in the back, or somewhere. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was curious, um, in your energy mix, you didn't really mention distributed generation. Um, distributed generation, yes, yes. Co-generation, it's yeah. to the other question about the wasted heat. Yes. Okay, so the Department of Energy actually has a, has a, has a came out with a research paper to, to see what what can be done to increase the use of cogeneration? Cogeneration means in a traditional power plant, we generate power and we generate a lot of waste heat, and that waste heat just gets dissipated through into lakes, into streams, or in, through cooling towers. With combined heat and power, we're actually going to tr we're able to use some of that waste heat, and instead of only being able to use one third of the energy that's in the fuel, we can bring that up to 60, 70, 80, 85%. Okay? So we can increase that, that the efficiency substantially. Okay? The problem is you have to find a way to, you have to have a consumer for that heat, right? So, uh, so as long as you have a consumer for that heat, you can do that. And so a lot of refineries, for example, use that on site, right? Because they need power to run the motors and the pumps but they also need a lot of steam and heat to run their refining operations, right? And so a lot of oil refineries actually use co combined heat and power. A lot of industrial facilities use combined heat and power. But, you know, if you're, if you're out in, you know, like our central power plants are way out, so they can't convert to this because there is no heat demand for this and there's no efficient, cost-effective way to ship that. Now, within a city, 
that's, again, that's a different picture. But within the city, the problem is putting the pipes, the heat pipes, underground, that's what's going to kill you. Uh, because it's, it's not so much the cost of the generation, the combined heat and power unit, it's how do I get that heat to you back there. Imagine in Chicago, right? You'd have to, I mean, you can't put the, you've seen the steam pipes driving around Oregon, right? We can do that. It looks okay, right? <laughs> uh, nobody cares. It's like, we're rocket scientists, right? So, but now trying to sell that, do that right next to Trump Tower downtown, I, get, I bet you Donald will have a problem with that. <laughs> so he will want to have those pipes on the ground, and that's what's going to be driving the costs up to a point where it just doesn't, just doesn't compute anymore. So it's a great technology, and distributed generation is, is a very promising promising uh, path, but you know, there's, there's downsides to that too, and challenges you know, to implement at a large scale. Yes? Is that uh, the two-thirds uh, waste in power plants, how does that break down between you know, your coal and gas, power, you know, like boiler plants and nuclear yeah, plants okay. and gas turbines? Yeah, so, so each one of the technologies is, doing, is, is sort of, uh, there's variations, okay? So if we look at brand new power plants, so I would say, now don't quote me on this, but a coal plant, probably I can build a brand new top of the line coal power plant and I can probably get 41 to 42% efficiency. I can bring that up, okay? I can build a brand new top of the line natural gas power plant. I have to get technical here, it's a called a combined cycle, so it's a special natural gas plant but I can bring the efficiency, the overall efficiency up to 60%. Right? So there's room for improvement. Right? Diesel generators are very poor, okay? 20% or sometimes even worse. So brand new, and, and a new nuclear power plant can probably easily do 35, 37, 38%. Okay? Brand new top of the line design. Now existing ones, it's different, right? Because we have a lot of power plants that are 40, 50 years old. They don't perform at their peak efficiency anymore. So, so again, it varies quite a bit across technologies. And the, you know, the, as, as they get older, they also get poor in terms of performance. So, so it can be from going from as low as 20, 25 to all the way up to 60%, just for electricity. Yeah. Um, I was wondering about economic incentives to adopt technologies yes. closer to home to store energy yeah. and help incentivize yeah. like flywheels and chiller tanks and things that can yeah. allow you to spread out your energy use. So, so uh, yes, financial incentives for you, if, me as a government, could be fed, the federal government, could be the state government, um, if I want people to buy more of a certain technology, I can provide, give you an incentive, right? So like for example, electric vehicles, there's what, seven and a half thousand dollar tax credit, right? So if you buy a Chevy Volt, you know, the government ships in seven and a half thousand dollars for that. Similar, I can do the same thing for a solar, solar panel or a small wind turbine, like what you saw in that store. Um, and that works. I mean, so the reason why Germany, again, the sun in Germany shines as much as the sun shines in Alaska. Okay? Just, to, just, to, just to make sure we understand, right? So they, they are the world leader in solar PV, basically putting it in Alaska. Now here, no one would ever think of putting 33,000 megawatts of solar power facilities into Alaska, where would we put it? We would put it in New Mexico, Arizona, Southern California, where the sun shines 300 days or plus more per year. So the reason why they did it in Germany is they had a federal, they, the federal government decided, yes, we want to stimulate that market and we will give everyone an incentive to buy this. And so they gave, the incentives were so attractive that they ended up being the world leader, even though the, the solar quality is so poor. Right? So it, make, it can make a huge difference. And in fact, what they did is affecting us too because they, the Germans, are spending a lot of money helping us because they're driving down the global cost of solar panels, even, of, even benefiting you and me. I was specifically thinking about home-based technologies that are innovative, yes. like flywheels and chillers. To yeah, so there's a, there's a really cool website. It's called uh, Desire, D-S-I-R-E. -S -S -I -I -E. Desire, 
and that dot gov, mm -hmm. I don't remember. It search for DSIRE database, web, uh, and uh, that actually lists for every state, by state it lists all the incentives for all the technologies that each one of the states offers. So it's, the, it's a centralized place to really look up, and you can find whether the state of Illinois, how much does the state of Illinois give you incentives for solar panels, for solar hot water heating, is there any incentive for any efficiency upgrades, smart appliances, efficient appliances, they keep track of all those incentives. So that's the place to look if you're interested in that. So let's take one final question one and final we'll have question. to wrap oh, okay. it up. There's a, somebody already with a microphone. Okay, uh, we're talking about the smart grid right yeah. here. It sounds like there's gonna have to be a lot of communications between the power company and the consumer here. Yeah. Is that correct? Well, where do we stand on that? Or how big a project is well, that? Well, okay, so there will be communication. So, right, so if you have a smart meter at your house, I don't know, so, so you can look up, in the, it, had, it was published in the newspaper and I think it'll get published uh, over and over again. Comet has a schedule for where the meters go, because you know, they have four million households and they're going to do this over eight or nine or 10 years or so. So every year they're rolling out about close to 400,000 meters. Okay? Um, and so once that meter comes your way and that meter gets installed, your current meter doesn't talk at all, right? So I have to send a meter reader out and he actually has to go, go and look and write down a number, right? So that new meter will actually talk back to me in the control center, right? So it will send a signal and it depends on the meter manufacturer and the particular model, but you could say it, it sends a signal it may send a signal every half hour or every 15 minutes, or it may send a signal every few hours. It depends on the particular kind of brand and, and model. And so it will actually talk back to me and say, all right, so here's how much you consume, right? So I know that instantaneously, and I, and I know the meter is on, and as long as the meter sends me a signal, I actually know that you have power. Right now, with your meter, if you lose power out there, if I'm, do you, if I'm comment, I don't know that you're out of power until you call me, right? So with that meter, if that signal doesn't come, I know you're out, and I can send a repair crew out and make sure you have power again. So that's one big benefit that we will all see because in theory, if it works the way it's designed, we should be out of power fewer hours because they can send the repair crews really all, out almost immediately because the meter's talking to me, right? At the same time, I can send a signal back to the meter and say, hey, just like what I showed you on that chart, right now the prices are really low. Maybe you want to take advantage of that, and maybe you want to turn things on. You know? Schedule your uh, laundry right now, or do something. You know? Or I can send you a signal and say, hey, right now there's a stress. The, I mean, I'm." Uh, there's lots of problems going on. It's not a really good time to turn additional things on, so I'll send you a signal and say, at your convenience, you know, it's your choice, I'm not forcing you, I'm just sending you a signal saying, if you're willing to do something, now would be a good time to turn off a certain piece of equipment. All right? So the meters will talk back and forth, and how often they talk depends really on the particular model and. And, and implementation. So the technology, so the meter will have a have, will have a radio frequency, a radio emitter, so it sends out a radio signal, and throughout the neighborhood on some of the poles, they'll have collection, they'll have receivers, and so I don't know for every couple of hundred meters or so they'll have one receiver, and then that receiver sends it to another place, and so the so it's sort of like a network of things, right? So how it collects the data. And then eventually it adds up at the, at the control center. Does it matter? Last one, very last one. The very yeah. last one. Does it matter one. who you buy, buy your power from? To use your plan? No, no, it doesn't matter at all, no. So, so, so the meter is part of the wiring infrastructure, and so who sells you the power through those wires through that meter doesn't matter at all, no. And again, it is totally optional. So once that meter is there, you, you don't have to change anything. All right? It is totally up to you. It's going to be up to you. Whether you want to do the, play the game that I play and risk that your family is going to hate you, 
or just do whatever you've done for the last 20, 30 years. It's totally up to you. So, right? Gunter, will you be going to anyone's home here to help them set up their own? <laughs> yes, uh, that's right. Yes, I will. <laughs> All right, let's thank Gunter for a, a wonderful presentation tonight. Thank you.